Hi folks, uh, it's thinking slow here, so this is really a big episode and probably the biggest one we've ever done. Um, the point of this episode is really to show you how the psychological manipulation works through Twitter using a very, very large bot farm. Uh, we're going to walk you through all the details of that. We're going to show you who's amplified, how they're amplified, and what they're amplified about, which, which uh, agenda items are they pushing. And it's no surprise that they're pushing uh, all of the great reset agenda items. And added to that, we're going to show you something quite interesting, which is setting up sort of what I call fifth column uh, operations, where uh, certain individuals are selected for massive boost of volumes uh, in terms of tweets and retweets, and then they are more than likely performing sort of agenda items uh, that again further the great reset. So uh, we're going to name some names here and uh, we're going to try and keep it relatively sensible to avoid any uh, exposure to any legal issues. So um, a few things I won't be able to say. Um, and also uh, because a lot, of, a lot of very hard research has gone into this, uh, we want to say to anyone, they're welcome to use the, the material and that there's links uh, on our webpage to both the slides and the and the benchmarking exercise that allows us to show the bot farm. But there must be copyright attribution, otherwise uh, we will basically stop people um, just uh, presenting this analysis as if it was their own. So it's, it's a very small limitation and not much to ask. Um, and as always, I uh, would very much appreciate the support on Patreon. Um, you know, this, this one has taken really a lot of work and uh, it's not for us without risk um, putting up names of uh, fairly high profile people in Parliament, in, in the media and sort of generally uh, sort of talking head personalities and saying these accounts are boosted by a bot farm on Twitter. I mean, that's quite a big statement to make and uh, I'm sure those people won't be thanking us for making that statement so uh, th this is sticking the neck out a little bit here so uh, that's why we need the support really and, and also as we go through this um, it's always going to end with a message of a call to action we're not here to just talk and this is one of the things we'll go into that actually a lot of fifth column operations are just to keep people talking and talking and talking it's uh, it's not even paralysis by analysis, it's just paralysis by talking, tweeting, listening into podcasts and not actually getting into getting into the policy making process because that's ultimately where sort of libertarians and true conservatives have to get into in order to stop this. Uh, it is a crazy agenda, I'm not going to beat the bush. This is really dangerous and insane, this whole great reset process. and unless you hook up with a political movement like Heritage or Alliance for Democracy and Freedom, you know, all of this analysis doesn't go anywhere. So we're not in here for the, for the chit-chat. You know, there is a call to action at the end, and we'll explain why it's so, so important that all of us, you know, get involved, really, because this is not going away. In fact, it's clearly going to get worse. And uh, again, I think this analysis will show you a lot about how the machinery operates and the very underhand uh, applied psychology that's used to manipulate people. Um, it's kind of spooky, so, so let's go. So you may remember on the other video, this was the key into the sort of bot farm. Uh, this single message uh, repeated over and over by about 240 accounts on the same day. Um, and we have then since then gone into the individual accounts and uh, we've actually walked around the sort of labyrinth of Twitter bot farm and we've identified both the bots and the beneficiaries of that bot activity and we'll show you through some benchmarking. When you, when you see the benchmarking it really is one of those things that once you've seen it you can't unsee it. The difference between a bot boosted account and a normal account doing you know the same kind of activity, the same kind of people in the, in the same sort of space in terms of either parliament or media, the, the disconnect between ordinary accounts and bot boosted accounts is absolutely jaw dropping. And, you know, it's clear that not only have we, you know, we figured this out, but the people inside these organizations must know this is going on, of course. So let's have a look at those those charts. So on to the next step. 
this is really the overview of how it works, basically. Um, we, we've put 30K in the bot farm. We don't really know how, how many it is, but that's a guess. You know, we, uh, we're not expert enough to actually nail this down to a hard number, but in a way, it doesn't really matter. What matters is it's very, very significant. And uh, we have put around here the, the topics that are being amplified and the accounts that are being amplified. Uh, and we, we've made some legal um, disclaimers about what we're saying and what we're not saying. But right now I can say for sure that, um, uh, that this apparent bot activity is amplifying these following accounts that are pushing uh, one. These, these are one sort of agenda item accounts, more or less. So remain, woke issues, nationalization, uh, economic war with Russia, uh, fifth column activities we'll go into, we're not putting these up, we know who they are, but we're not going to put them up just yet. Um, there's an opposition figure, uh, and in opposition we mean that this, uh, this activity is primarily associated with what you'd call left politics, but uh, this account is also primary, a very significant beneficiary of the bot amplification, and we're not really sure why, but that's why opposition question mark is up here. Uh, climate issues, and then some, uh, I guess the best way to say is left-leaning, I guess is one way to classify um, these individuals, but they're getting also very significant boosting from this bot uh, machinery. And we'll explain to you what the bots are and why we're, you know, 99.9% .9 certain they are bots. So um, let's go on to then um, the classification of the bots and why we're 99.9% .9 certain uh, they are bots. And basically what they're doing is they're amplifying uh, the traffic of those selected accounts by a factor of, you know, about 100 or more. I mean, in some cases slightly less, but in some cases it's much, much more, basically. And that's amplification relative to an account that's not benefiting uh, from the activities of the bot, of the bot farm uh, sort of network. And um, we, we looked at this and we, we ran some figures uh, trying to look at parameters of accounts and that's sort of pointless because it's obvious that any bot that's been set up will be set up with those um, parameters, the mathematical parameters in mind, you know, whether it's how many retweets per like or, you know, retweets per month or f likes per follower or any of that stuff. It's, it's pointless looking for bots with, with those parameters because you know they they will meet those parameters but the obvious thing to do uh, is to look at bots uh, from the point of view of, of a human being and you know we look at this one for example Chris um, you know is what Chris is doing in any way possible in your point of view um, as a human using Twitter as you as a user yourself is what he's is what he's up to feasible in any way uh, as a person and, and the answer is no and it's so easy when you see it because, you know, this this version of the bot we call the overt bot. And the overt bot is basically festooned with these little images and there'll be a big slogan. And this is standard for all of them. Once you've seen it, you'll never unsee this. There's a big slogan uh, and a cartoon picture here. Now, what all this stuff is supposed to do is supposed to attract a a, a user who identifies with the group that they're appealing to. So. I'm a, I'm a sort of, you know, obviously follow back part of Europe is a big one, but this one is some kind of messaging, 3.5%, something to do with revolutions, and everyone who's into that will click this and follow. Uh, the blue flags are sort of European, pro-Europe, that could, tends to go together. Uh, the mask wearing, the blue heart, you know, etc. So if someone sees all this, this is like baiting, baiting stuff on, on a hook for a fish, they will follow this. So... You know, that's a way for this bot to get some genuine followers and also then having been followed, they will see the traffic of real human users. So it starts to get, you know, in, intertwined, basically. Um, now, this one is, is kind of the opposite situation. and We call this the covert bot. So here is uh, here is absolutely no information whatsoever, no picture. There's quite a lot of these. And, you know, if you look at it, there's uh, no followers, no real uh, tweets but if you open the likes tab you get a huge number 12.6 thousand so you know we're being asked to believe that someone with this weird 4523170 no photo uh, doesn't write anything has no followers doesn't follow anyone 
but just sits there and hits like, 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 like all the time. Completely ridiculous. I don't know. It just beggars belief that any person would do that. So I'm saying this is a bot. And, and, and we can also say that because this type of profile is repeated over and over and over and over and over again. So not only is there supposed to be one person like this, but there's supposed to be about 10,000 people like this doing uh, this activity. Completely nuts in my view. And this is, these are obviously bots, and I think, you know, the powers that be must also know that it's, it's blindingly obvious when you look closely. And just mo one more word about the, um, the, the overt bot. The overt bot, their function is primarily retweeting, it's not liking. So if you go through this account, so this is 133,000 tweets, which is a crazy, crazy number. Um, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but that's extraordinarily high. And uh, they're not replies, so they're, and they're not tweets, they're retweets. So again, you're expecting us to believe that this guy, Chris, is going to sit there and just retweet someone else's material uh, f feverishly every single day, every day. And, and that's what, by the way, generating this kind of number means essentially a full-time job. Okay, they've, you know, it's, it's been around a long time, but when you start looking at the, uh, at the periods of tweeting, they're all crammed into quite short periods of time. So... Essentially, 24-7, uh, this guy, Chris, is going to be uh, just retweeting other people's material without writing anything himself, and more or less without liking any, anything himself. Whereas Suzeel is going to be sitting there liking everything, not retweeting it, and not uh, writing anything his or herself, um, again, sort of 24-7 to get to this sort of 12,000 figure. Neither of those things are remotely realistic, and again, with this overt account there's tens of thousands of them doing exactly the same thing so let's start um, generalizing then what that delivers because it's more than just volume it's also radicalization it's what's going on with this bot network and, and we've been looking at it that's why we can say that with it. this is hard to show with data but we'll give you the data that shows how the, the network really operates and this is an additional feature so what really is happening is you, you basically start with a sort of 50-50 picture, people relatively close politically, 50-50 sort of left versus right, and we, we're not going to get into a long argument about how relevant that is right now. Uh, let's, let's just call it left versus right. You know, roughly speaking, those are the election outcomes. Obviously, they change one way or the other, but that's roughly the opening position. Now, what the bot farm is doing is uh, piling on uh, extra volume onto onto this side. But the more, well, this is more radical. So these would be the sort of more radical agenda items of the Great Reset. So you radicalize the climate debate, make it a climate emergency. You know, you radicalize COVID and make it a mass lockdown and endless mask wearing. So all of that messaging is kind of is roughly say you know for illustration is tripled. Now the much more, uh, so, so the impression is of course what this is supposed to do to a user is to make them think everybody's doing this, therefore so must you. Whereas this is actually completely unrepresentative compared to what the real picture is, which is 50-50 balance. Um, but the, the user in this case is going to be overwhelmed with this and they're going to want to go, go along with this because this is the allegedly the majority view if you look at likes and retweets. Now this side of the equation is much, much more interesting because this is actually also boosted and that's sort of counterintuitive. But what's been done here is the boosting is um, targeted at a handful of individuals. And essentially what the algorithms and the, and the bot farm are doing is that they're, 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 they're sort of demoting this cause as a whole, but they're relatively promoting a handful of individuals. And it's our position that those handful of individuals will then be useful for the sort of agenda, in inverted commas, uh, going forward. So that's a deliberate uh, tactic to essentially promote uh, their chosen individuals above, above other individuals within the sort of liberty group. And we'll, we'll look at an example of that. The other thing that's going on here is clearly radicalization. So... This is a separate story, but some of the more offensive tweets are taken by the bots and sent to the respective sort of interest group. And that's that's a sort of ongoing and well-known process of radicalization. And that is also happening. You get some pretty offensive tweets thrown at you 
by uh, by by the retweets of the sort of overt group, and that is radicalizing people, um, as far as we can see. I mean, this we have less evidence on, but uh, that's the way it is. So I want I want to get into the specifics because, as I said, once you've seen the charts, the you'll never unsee them. But I want to do an illustration, basically, of why we think pretty well most of the like and the retweet traffic in, in Twitter is actually not genuine. And we're only doing this as an illustration because we don't know for sure. We, we haven't done enough analysis. We can't do all the analysis as an outsider to really, to really work that out. But just walk through this example with me and then you'll see why I think the, um, the fake bot traffic is so high, basically. So let's say you know, the process begins with 100 people writing a message uh, they get one like uh, for, for each message from a real another real person. So you've got 100 likes and 100 likes. And then what the bot farm is doing is very significantly um, emphasizing for its own reasons uh, this group because it wants to pursue this policy agenda. So if you say multiply by 10, and we, we don't know what this number is, this is an illustration. Uh, this would go then to 1,000 uh, likes post, uh, post bot farm. And as I said before, they want to hand out some extra likes here, but targeted at the individuals that they want to use or they want to see promoted within that interest group. So you're, you're basically having a multiple of 1.1, so a 10% increase. So you've ended up creating 900 fake likes and 10 fake likes uh, in this group. And if you just go through the maths, uh, what it means is you've, you've added, you know, you started off at 50-50, you've moved now to a, an appearance that 90% of the likes are in what I call the fake Labour group, uh, because I don't believe too much in Labour Conservative anymore. But you've made this 90, so you've added 40 percentage points onto this in terms of someone looking in at the likes. If you just sort of looked at likes, you'd see 90% of likes post bot farm are sort of left causes and only 10% are right causes. So you've You've added 40% dishonestly and manipulated the real world situation. And at the same time, you've taken 40% away from the sort of right causes, the more libertarian conservative point of view. So you've completely twisted reality. Uh, and in this case, uh, that would generate 80% fake um, traffic for likes and retweets. But as I said, we don't know exactly these numbers, but I think this is not a crazy, this is not a crazy way of illustrating how this is really working. So now let's get to some specifics because this is really where your jaw should be hitting the floor, basically. So let's go now to the, the concrete um, uh, examples. And I think with these, once you've seen it, I mean, look at that, once you've seen it, there's no one seeing it. It seems completely obvious that the, the bot amplified accounts uh, on the right are just orders of magnitude higher than the accounts that have not been magnified for for people of a sort of similar kind of um, notoriety and similar activity and, and the, the difference is just is, is jaw-dropping essentially. So um, these accounts uh, on the right we didn't choose, they are the sort of within the bot uh, farm activity and these are names uh, that just came out the other end. So that there's a longer list of, if you add all of them up but these are the ones that we chose to put on this chart. All in all there's about I would say around about 20 important accounts that are boosted by the bot farm activity. So you've got a handful here that we chose, but essentially all of them are ending up at these sort of mid mid 5,000 uh, likes per tweet figure. Uh, yeah, there's there's some variation in here, and we're, we're going to drill down and look at you know we'll look at MPs versus MPs. We'll look at uh, journalists versus journalists to make it apples apples versus apples rather than what we have here but this is like the overview and then on this side I mean look at this this is the the, the difference is just jaw-dropping and we're talking about you know pretty serious guys uh, on on the right side uh, James Dellingpole, Toby Young, Peter Hitchens we put in Professor Fenton because I mean he's an academic obviously but we know him well and he's done a lot of work on uh, COVID and you know here and his numbers quite high but again compared to a uh, Zara Sultana who's the young momentum MP for Coventry South it's, it's just jaw-dropping what we're expected to believe um, the difference in interest in her material versus 
professor professor fenton says you know look i mean look at that one i mean do you really honestly believe uh, that there's 20 times more interest in zara sultana's tweets which are always the same there the sort of party political slogans you know we need private we need nationalization now sort of repeated in 10 10 different formats there's no real content there uh, whereas here you've got masses, masses and masses of original, insightful content. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. And I want to say one comment about Desmond Swain, why he appears quite high is because he does very, very few tweets. And therefore, 10 tweets covers very many months of activity on his Twitter account. So the average looks quite high and you, you could adjust this. We have adjusted it for sort of tweets uh, or likes per month but it, it, it doesn't add much insight really you know so but I, I did want to keep this in to make the representation fair and you know you have to slap yourself on the face here and remind yourself that more people voted conservative in the last election in Labour so this pool of people who are more likely to be interested in this side than that side this pool is smaller than this side so what Twitter is asking you to believe is based on a smaller pool, the engagements would be a factor of 10 higher, which means that the, the people supporting, you know, these left leaning individuals would have to be sitting 24 seven on Twitter, just liking and retweeting and, and liking every single thing this group wrote. Again, it's not realistic. You know, the reality is this is the reality. These, this is realistically how many likes you can expect to get from a tweet from a really good content rich account. It's gonna, and I have looked at this over and over and it's based on benchmarking, but three, 400 is pretty good to be honest uh, for someone who's doing sort of average rate tweeting. So what I'm saying is this is not reality that you have to sort of try and rationalize. All of this is fake, all of this above 400, it's all manufactured by bots all of it it's fake the whole thing and you can see that now as we go in and compare very much apples with apples one mp with another it's just again so completely obvious that this is fake so here's the first um comparison very straightforward uh we're compa comparing three labor mps in three adjacent constituencies and this is zara sultana who benefits from the bot farm uh, average like per t per tweet of over 7,000, two Labour MPs in neighbouring constituencies doing the same job, um, 12 likes per tweet, eight likes per tweet versus more than 7,000. I mean, come on, guys, let's get real. I mean, is this individual really 180 times more popular with her content than her next nearest neighbours? It's just totally beyond belief. Again, I'm maintaining, um, you know, they can sue and do whatever they want, but this is all fake. So from here up to here, it's all fabricated. Uh, and again, as I said, the, um, the, the content of the messages are pretty weak. It's just the same old, we need more government interventions said, you know, on 500 different permutations every day. There's no, there's nothing in it, basically. So the idea it would be, you know, I could announce on Twitter now that I've just discovered a new form of, uh, of energy that we can make from water. I'm not going to get 7,000 likes on that. And the idea that you'd get 7,000 likes on, you know, let's have more nationalization every day, day in, day out, it's ludicrous. And that's because all of this is fake. And um, um, I think you can see it from the chart. We're actually going to do another video where we'll scroll through with viewers. Um, what, and you'll see all of those two types of um, bots turning up again and again, the overts and the coverts, one after the other. And it's so clear again, you can do that experiment yourself. Go to any like uh, of Zara Sultana and scroll through the accounts that are liking it. And you'll see only those two types of bot, the overt and the covert. And we can do that on a, on a video demonstration somewhere else. But it's not necessary because you can see from the numbers on this benchmarking. Uh, here's another one then, here's uh, Chris Bryan, exactly the same thing. We, we took uh, two adjacent MPs in the Labour Party um, and again, exactly the same picture. The 
you know, is it a is it is it feasible that the account that benefits from the you know is this a question of this account benefit benefiting from the bot farm, which generates five and a half thousand likes per tweet? Uh, is it feasible that that's really driven by reality? You know, much better content uh, with roughly the same potential interest group versus fifteen for Wayne David and twelve for Alex Davies Jones and. The answer to me is absolutely no way. Um, it's this is fake. All of this is fake. And again, the same story. We can click uh, on any any like of a Chris Bryant tweet and scroll through who's done those likes, and we'll see overt covert bots over and over and over and over again. And then the last one, um, oh, not the last one. The last one on the political side is the uh, Liberal Party. We said uh, Ed Davey was um, a beneficiary of that bot farm uh, network, and we just compared that to his deputy. And okay, the leader's always going to have more uh, interest than the deputy, but again, look at that. This is 50, a factor of 50 times. So, 3,382 likes per tweet from uh, Ed Davey versus 69 from his nearest deputy. So, again, is it really realistic that? the leader would be 50 times more popular than the deputy. Again, you know, the same kind of potential interest group, liberal voters, um, the content's going to be roughly the same, plus minus, uh, but yet somehow by magic this is 50 times more popular. The answer, as far as we're concerned, is no. Um, and then uh, the last one uh, we're going to do is, uh, is the journalists. So we just took together the journalists and put them all together. Um, the line is again the average um, average likes per tweet, and it's on this axis. Uh, and and this one is the total number of followers, which is which is the bar. Um, and we're focusing in on likes. Um, you can't see the numbers here because it gets cluttered up. But this is you know low hundreds of likes per tweet across all of these journalists. We cross the line into the um, into the journalists who are benefiting from the bot activity. And we're into you know a couple of thousand plus, and then in this case, uh, I think that's nearly six thousand likes per tweet. Again, you know, realistically, you know, the the, the viewership of this group is meant to be bigger in theory. Um, I mean, is it realistic that uh, in this case it works out that all of the likes added up together? Uh, for all of these journalists who are well known, been in the business for years, have books. Is three times three point seven times less than than the likes for Matthew Stadlin, who's hardly a well-established uh, journalist, you know, at the cutting edge. So, all of them added together is still three point seven times less added together than this guy on his own. I mean, realist. I mean, it's it's just it's just not serious. And again, you know, if you draw this line across here, this would be reality. And then all of that to get to here, to get to here to get to here, we're maintaining it's all bot farm activity. So uh, let's just do one more basically, uh, which is not, it's not really uh, agenda items. Um, and those things tend to be full on magnification all the time. But this was a transient magnification of the tweets of Dominic Cummings when he was attacking the prime minister um, and at that, at those, on those few days in early July, all of a sudden, uh, these figures went shooting up through the roof and then, uh, and then went back down to something more reasonable after that. So we think what they did with the volume knob was they turned the volume knob up for a few days on this account and then turned it back down when it was no longer sort of needed. Um, and just for sort of benchmark again, if you looked at that chart there with low hundreds, of likes per tweet, we think that's reality basically. So if you have a well-established account like Peter Hitchens or Delling Pohl or Alison Pearson, they're, they're roughly in the same ballpark, round numbers, 100,000 100, um, uh, followers each basically, and roughly the same, I mean, there's difference in the number of tweets they do, but 100,000 um, uh, 100, followers on a really solid conservative account that's producing really high quality content will generate you about 400 likes per tweet. So you, you, this is not realistic, 17, 20,000 per, uh, per tweet from these guys. It just really isn't. And sure enough, every time you see that, you can then open it up, you'll see the overt bots and the covert bots over and over and over again. 
And as a general principle, I would say, okay, there's obviously exceptions, but if you see stuff over 500 likes per tweet, uh, you'd be suspicious, basically, and, and go and check who's making those likes and see if you can find the whole list stuffed full of bots, which is what we found every single time over and over again. Um, so just for the lawyers as well out there, you know, what we've established now is the sort of end result of the activity of those bots. Uh, we haven't established, you know, who's doing what to who. We just said, this is a fact. Now, you know, there's a number of reasons why that could be the case. It could be people are paying to boost volumes and there's services around that do that. Uh, it could be the algorithms sort of out of control that are, that are in charge of those bots and doing stuff on their own uh, and we're not saying at this stage on here because we're not wishing to stick our neck out further than necessary but uh, they can be aware or unaware of this now um, you know I think you have to be very arrogant to assume that your stuff is 180 times more interesting than than your fellow MP down the road but you know arrogance is not necessarily collusion so mm -hmm. And we're also not commenting on what the bot, who's operating exactly the bot farm. Um, I'm going to sort of stick my neck out and say it's this sort of, it has been called out in various different publications. Uh, we, we have um, this deep state blob. I mean, I think that's a sort of nebulous kind of entity, but we can refer to it here. The deep state blob is pursuing the great reset agenda that much we're certain of. And we, we, we have to believe that that deep state blob is pulling those uh, volume adjustments up and down on that dashboard that we looked at. That's our assumption. We actually think we know who's doing what, but we're not going to say it here. But that's the chain of events. The sort of deep state nebulous blob is running that bot farm uh, by putting in the parameters that push up that magnification. And are we saying that the beneficiaries are colluding or aware of that? No. We're saying uh, it's unlikely they'd be unaware that they're being boosted, but it's not impossible that they just don't they don't put one and one together. But that's all we're saying. So you know, if you want to threaten us with stuff, then that's what we're actually saying. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, so just really wrapping up now, I wanted to go into the structural part part of this, which is more important really than than well than some of the numbers maybe. But look. Um, you know, this is Edward Bernays, and uh, anyone that's read any of these books about psychological ma manipulation will recognize, you know, psychological manipulation writ large on those um, magnification processes. So this is what he said. Um, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without them knowing it. Now... I think a lot of what's going on is exactly that, basically, and, and again, this is a you know, this is a well-established sort of applied psychology um, field of science, and I think it's very much being used in what we're looking at here. And we'll show you a couple of very interesting things now about the things you won't be aware of. So one of those things um, we find quite interesting. Uh, we might do more work on this. We've got the data. Whether we're going to publish it or not, we don't know yet, but. Um, what we're seeing is essentially uh, another group of bots, uh, which we believe is part of this whole operation, which is amplifying um, more what we'd consider to be libertarian stroke right causes. And you remember back in the beginning, I said there would be a 10% uplift uh, in, in the right group, but that wasn't targeted across the group. That was targeted at some key individuals for whatever reason, uh, whoever is behind the bot farm has decided to amplify up those individuals. I, I, I know why they've done it and I know what the next step is, but I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna say it here. Um, our, general, uh, our general idea is that is obviously to damage uh, the right cause, it's not to help it. So um, the reason that those particular individuals um, are being chosen is that they are not, they're not, um, taking that attention and using it to get into the political process to achieve real change. So I've looked at the accounts of some of those people being amplified and they just talk, it's basically endless talk and endless emotional triggering uh, about, you know, you're being, you're being ripped off. And let's say one proposed solution is to change the, the blue guys for the red guys. Now, as a libertarian, we know that for us at least, the problem is not the red guys versus the blue guys. 
it's the state it's completely out of control and it's moving into a sort of totalitarian dystopia so all hands should be to the pump to actually roll back and fight the state overreach it's absolutely nothing to do with left versus right but those uh, those people who are being um, boosted now can turn that um, uh, that that frustration with the libertarian cause into a party political fight, which is not what this is about. So you're diverting away that energy into the long grass, into pointless uh, initiatives. Now the other the other thing they're doing is creating um, sort of initiatives and alternatives, and completely ignoring the you know the already massively fragmented libertarian movement today. So you know, as an example, uh, there's talk of, let's say, you know, person B is now the new person to talk to about um, digital ID and encroachment on sort of digital privacy. Well, actually, there's already, uh, there is already a pressure group dealing with that issue has been pretty successful. So again, it's like, it's just sort of creating noise and diluting actually the ability of the existing pressure group to mobilize and achieve political change. So we're calling that stuff a uh, fifth column and we're pretty sure it exists and, it, and it's going to become clearer and clearer o over the next uh, few weeks, basically. But that's w what we think is going on there. And as I said, we can work that out through the bot traffic, which is why this is useful, because it gives us into an insight into how they're using the applied psychology and how they are use using this to create these sort of fifth column operations and also potentially controlled opposition. But that's for later. We, we're not going to mention the names right now. We've already done enough of that for one one session. Um, so you know, let's let's just wrap up. I think um, one thing we're seeing now is, is is the next stage of this process, and it's it's again the um, you know problem reaction solution. You know what we're seeing now is uh, building a consensus around various types of nationalisation and lots of calls for hey the government needs to step in and allocate benefits between uh, consumers and producers. I mean that's like literally communism, and um, it'll start with energy companies, then they'll go to something else and something else. And the really sad thing about all of this is everyone is going to cheer about it. And we know we know that the Great Reset agenda is very closely tied up with neo-Marxism. Uh, you know, l let alone uh, P Professor Mitchie. There's other professors in there. I, I'm not going to go into that. Who are neo-Marxists who are quite deep into the policy-making circles of the Great Reset, and that's what they want. And we're going to cheer them on as they do it, basically. And then a couple of years down the road, like everything else, like lockdown, like money printing, like economic war with Russia, we're going to go. Oh man, that was a bad idea. But at the time, it's the consensus building, the manipulation is all pushing us into delivering the Great Reset agenda items and cheering for them at the same time. It's kind of depressing when you know how all this works and, and just watching it happen and you're sort of jumping up and down saying, look, this is a bad idea, but the, you know, the, 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 the applied psychology is working and then it's, it's, it's like a freight train, very difficult to stop, basically. Uh, but anyway, we, th we think exposing some of this stuff might help, but uh, realistically, this is going to still go in the wrong direction for quite some time. So let's, let's go now and do a very quick, um, really big picture uh, study here. So, you know, ultimately, I think we're beginning to realize that this is a clash of value systems. Um, and even, to be fair, the globalists have laid out their new religion. It is a religion. They... They've basically said, you know, essentially man is God now and, uh, and, and humans are just biological uh, machines. There's, there's nothing more or less to them. And that is, you know, that essentially is a sort of religious kind of thinking. And that's all very well described in this book by Joseph Boot, who we're hopefully going to be able to speak to at some point. Uh, because this is really, he really lays this out so, so well. You know, this is a new religion. It's not just sort of rational man makes up his own rules. There's religious beliefs in there. And those religious beliefs are, are flourishing because we're destroying Christianity. We've essentially destroyed it. And, you know, the idea that you just get rid of it and something white and fluffy replaces it is a fallacy. And you just look at the overtones of what these guys are up to on the Great Reset side and you realize these are not nice guys. 
and what they're doing is it's not going to be white and fluffy it's going to be anything but uh, and we've just seen just uh, you know just the ethics of the applied psychology to me is mind-blowing and that's just the smallest issue in in what these guys are up to and and the way they do things unethically um, and then and just you know this is one small quote from the book um, that's maybe worth reading out and uh, I think he's talking about the, re the, the French Revolution here. Uh, Burke recognized that beneath the veneer of their liberal discourse concerning equality, liberty, and brotherhood, the revolutionaries were pursuing the elimination of the Christian faith from every sphere of life. And much of the book um, continues to go on and, and makes those contrasts that we actually are creating uh, a secular religion which actually is, I, f I find it very disturbing. You know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm, not, a, I'm not a diehard um, Christian, uh, you know, I'm a sort of l lapsed Christian, but I would rather have lapsed Christianity than what these guys want. And I think it's very, very dark when you get into what these guys are really up to. Anyway, so, you know, that's the big picture. So, um, as I said, we always do things with, with a view to um, having tangible results and something happening at the other end. And I've said a lot of fifth column activity is just keeping you spinning around in endless discussion without going to the next step of, okay, so what do we do about this, basically? And we've put in here, um, you know, we think some simple, at least conceptually simple things that, that really need to happen if we're going to get out of this great reset. Uh, if you don't want it, then you're going to have to fight to stop it not fight literally but fight politically and just lastly then you know um, we've put this up a few times this this isn't the definitive guide to the future because there's no such thing but it it is it is a, a version of the future that was written in 1992 so this is not like Monday morning quarterbacking as they say in America this was you know 30 years ago this guy wrote this and there's various views on his credibility I am I'm a fan I've read the stuff and everything I've managed to put together fits in with what he did I mean perhaps he got a few things slightly I'm not 100% convinced about but you know more or less the core part everything I've seen fits 100% with his analysis and it was an analysis driven book and this is what he said I mean you know 30 years ago and we're seeing this exactly now and all of this is happening now um, one to one and you can read the book and it's all written in there and there's other kind of slightly oddball voices. Uh, Alan Watts is a guy we listened to a few podcasts of his from years and years ago, uh, talking about basically these same things. And at some point you have to sort of say, uh, okay, this is not a coincidence that what these guys say, based on their analysis of what the globalists want, end up happening. That means the globalists are pushing this agenda. And it's hard to convince someone who just, you know, they just don't get it, but the, but this is now becoming obvious, really, that when you make predictions that keep happening, that probably means you this is a deliberate policy, and you figured out what that policy is, and then it's been implemented. You know that's that's the circle basically. So uh, just finishing up then, as as we always said, we want to um, we want to try and keep things uh, positive practically. So it's really essential people join real existing um, uh, political movements and we've had heritage here and we like alliance a lot as well because right now the, um, the, the sort of liberal resistance movement is completely fragmented and uh, you know we've reached out several times to cooperate as we can I think our analysis is worth having and we can feed that into any sort of policy making or plans going forward and again it's so difficult to uh, get out of the day-to-day -day attacks because they're happening from so many different angles and so many different places. Um, but, you know, we'd be happy to help out with that. And for, for ordinary people as well, to they have to join in, really, because this is only going to get worse. And we've all got children and grandchildren, and it's just not an option, I don't think, to stick your head in the sand and hope for the best because this is going to get worse and uh, it's probably going to get a fair bit worse but it's going to get less worse if people join in uh, and go into these political organizations and but on the, at the same time we very much be against uh, formation of new things that turn into talking shops that just draw away the oxygen from existing initiatives and I think that's what we hinted at with this fifth column it's taking out the oxygen it's drawing away the attention and making it 
less likely that these organizations will get more traction, more momentum and get, get results basically. And that's really what we need. Uh, and again, we've said it before, we think the two party paradigm is, 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 is ludicrous to, uh, to think that that's gonna get us out of that. And, and I, as I said, on the, even on the bot program, you can see them amplifying both sides at once. So, you know, this is a game, essentially, you, you know, you're, you're backing both sides. So you need, you need someone that's independent of the oligarchy, and these organizations are independent of the oligarchy. And they've got good plans and good people and trustworthy people, and integrity actually matters in these organizations, as far as we can tell. You know, let's hope we're right on that. But you know, that, that's the core of anything towards stopping what's going on, and anything else... Trust versus Sunak is just a, it's not even a sideshow it's just a complete theater basically so that's our that's our call to action uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode uh, we found it jaw dropping putting this together and we can keep using this insights now to work out what the next fifth column sort of activity is going to be and what the next thing is to amplify through through that bot network. And just lastly, I want to say uh, one word about you know why we put this together and where the where the authorities stand on this stuff. So we put this together because we understood that the various authorities in various countries don't necessarily want you looking at this bot operation and understanding how it works because it's a massive tool of applied psychology and influence over the population. That's the reason no one really publishes anything too coherent about how this stuff is all happening. We've looked at some of the analysis uh, done post sort of Russia claims of the um, election manipulation, and that all goes off into the long grass. It doesn't really tell you anything about what's going on and what to, and what to do about it. Now, any one of those charts that you looked at, you can see, you can smell a rat there. So let's be let's be certain that Twitter knows about this. Let's be certain that the authorities that are meant to be essentially preventing this know about this. And I go the next step of that thinking. So they know about it, what are they doing about it? Nothing. Why are they doing nothing? Because it suits their purpose. That's the only possible explanation. So, you know, to, and we've heard phrases from these very strange people like Tobias Elwood, who's taken it upon himself to decide that the army should control the narrative. What on earth does that mean? Who are you? What narrative are you controlling? Clearly, with the bot farm operation that we've exposed today, narratives are being controlled. Now, does that mean the people who are supposed to be overseeing this know that and they're, let's say, at best, just allowing it to happen and at worst they may be complicit in all of this? I mean, who knows, really? Again, we don't want to be sued for anything, so we're not going to push that point. But you know, that's also a huge question. Where are the authorities? Why are they allowing this to happen? Once you've seen it, it's out in the open. If we know it, they know it. What are they up to? So if you like this, please share it because it's important that we basically stop this manipulation of people and stop this creating these alternative realities that totally distort the truth. And we will do our part. We will write to the um, Parliamentary Committee on standards and say these MPs who are benefiting from this should know it. It's misleading, dishonest, and they shouldn't be doing it. But we're not too optimistic about what those guys are going to say. That you know there'll be all kinds of arguments they didn't know, we couldn't tell. Are you sure, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But we'll do that. So other people, please uh, share this uh, as far and wide as you can. That would really help. Subscribe to the channel if you want. I mean, I think the stuff we put up here is. I know it's good. I mean, I know it's way ahead of time. And if you want to keep receiving it, put it here. And no doubt they will now push us out of this thing. So always look for us on Rumble as well. And we're going to be much more active on Telegram. Uh, we always appreciate the help on um, Patreon. But again, you know, importantly for us is, you know, we want to be part of something more structured. And the opposition now is just so fragmented. We're not really going to be able to put much of a, of a stop to this great reset. So we continue to volunteer uh, to share our work and insights with anyone credible who's interested. So, you know, we would want to be part of this, but at this stage we're kind of frustrated to see such a fragmented opposition to such a well-organized machine on the other side. And that's, that, that's not going to bode well until, uh, until the opposition is it's much, much more aligned. And that was really the mission, uh, 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 mission for the Alliance for Dem Democracy and Freedom. 
it's a great mission and hopefully you know they can get more people on board and, and a united front against this uh, a great reset uh, oligarchy because otherwise things are going to get quite hairy anyway thanks folks and uh, as we stay at the end, say at the end of every show uh, do not stay safe stay free because without freedom you do not have safety thank you bye